Good afternoon. My name is Steve Love, President and CEO of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. Welcome. We're delighted that you're participating in our first webinar of 2018, Digital Health Technology Trends. We really appreciate you being here today. We're co-hosting today's webinar with an associate member of the council, uh, Accenture, and we're delighted uh, for the number of people that have signed up for this webinar. Accenture solves many of their clients' toughest challenges by providing services in strategy, consulting, digital technology, and operational work. They partner with more than three quarters of the Fortune Global 500 companies in the United States, and they themselves are a publicly traded company. They bring expertise across more than 40 industries, and they deliver transformational outcome in the new digital world. I'm here with Tiffany and Dillip, but our speaker today and the featured speaker today is Dr. Kave Safavi. And Dr. Safavi will discuss artificial intelligence in healthcare, ecosystem power plays, the workforce marketplace, and new designs for humans and definitions for the future. At Accenture, he not only is responsible for developing growth strategies, but he works closely with healthcare providers. Previously, he served in leadership roles at Thomson Reuters, United Healthcare, HealthSpring, and Humana. So we're delighted that you've joined us. So let's begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Savavi. Thank you, Steve. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, delighted you can join me for this uh, presentation and conversation. Uh, and I appreciate the introduction, Steve. We have a, a chat box. So uh, as I talk, if you have questions that you would like my reaction to, feel free to enter it in there and then I will try to find a, a good place to uh, respond to that question. Uh, we call this discussion here technology for people and it's really a reflection of the fact that technology and digital technology is changing the very nature of business and healthcare. It used to be that we thought about technology as a feature. Uh, the reality is that it's actually much more central to the nature of healthcare and I'm going to take you through the reason why that is. But if you think about things like the demographic trends and an aging population, uh, driving demand and fewer working people and citizens, uh, fewer working people to serve that demand, combined with the fact that citizens, because of their life experiences, expect to have a health experience on their own terms, where and when they want it. What you see very quickly is that two major challenges that healthcare faces uh, all over the world is the challenge of becoming both personalized and productive. And oftentimes when we think about healthcare technology, uh, we think about things like um, analytics for finding the most acutely ill patients or uh, care coordination or practice pattern variation or uh, patients uh, following their doctor's orders and, uh, and living a healthy lifestyle. And all of those things are good. But the truth of the matter is that the driving challenges around uh, productivity and personalization can only be solved through approaches that take advantage of some of these technologies. In fact, these exponential technologies are not simply means to an end, but they're actually going to change the ends in themselves. 50 years ago, if you were sick, you felt lucky to be seen by a physician and uh, to get any care at all. But today, people expect that they're going to get care on their own terms. And our care model is moving from one that is not just about a one-on-one -on -one interaction, but one that is location agnostic, self-service, uh, virtual, and physical, as well as personalized. And what I want to share with you is five technology trends that we've been following across all of society, and then talk about their implications in healthcare specifically that represent this continued evolution of the interaction of technology and business. The overarching theme of this vision is that technology is for people. It's designed by humans and it's for humans. It's not about 
moving from humans to machines. It's really about humans and machines combined. And it's not simply what technology can do for people, it's what people can do with technology. So what you see up here, first, uh, the first picture is really about expectations. Uh, this comes from work that we do around experience design for healthcare. Experience design is an approach where you actually watch people struggle with the healthcare system and try to discern what they want. And there's other research to back this up, but what you see is as people struggle through the healthcare system, the things that they're looking for, the things that the problems they need to be solved fall into categories like simplicity, seamlessness, transparency, security, et cetera. And it is that gulf in demand that creates the opportunity that can be filled in by a variety of technologies. Uh, Tiffany, if you go to the next picture, at the same time, what's happening is a realization that healthcare as a sector is actually becoming less productive rather than more productive. That means that we need even more people to provide the level of services uh, that are being demanded. Uh, so extreme that one of the countries I work in, in um, Finland, which is one of the fastest aging populations uh, in the world, an economist there recently predicted that by, because of the aging population, which drives demand but reduces the workforce at the same time, if they don't change the way they provide healthcare from the human-based model they have today, by 2050, every single person in the workforce would have to work in healthcare. So this isn't just a cost problem. This is functionally um, a uh, ability to serve problem. If you go to the next uh, picture, uh, the next slide, please, Tiffany, uh, what we're seeing more and more is a reality that the way we think about care today, which is people come to a place in order to have an interaction with a caregiver, is going to evolve to a totally different model. One that is has a greater component of self-service, one that has a component of being location agnostic, a component that's virtual, and the net effect is on our, um, on our own terms, where and when we want it. We're already seeing results in survey data around, thing, around uh, patients' expectations for healthcare uh, that register things like uh, over 50% of, of citizens of the United States would like their annual exam, their annual physical exam to be done virtually. We think about the implications of people's expectations about something like an annual exam, um, the gulf between how it is today and how it can be become larger. Uh, and at the same time, we've done some analysis that suggests that uh, just care for diabetics in a primary care office, about 11% of the work that's being done by physicians today, primary care physicians, can be done either by the patient themselves by a non-physician or by technology, creating 11% more capacity in our primary care physician workforce without having to add any new physicians. And it's the combination of those two things, the liberation of those two things, that is what we think is gonna drive the care model. So with that, I'd like to move to the first of the five technology trends that we wanna talk about. And, the, and if you can go to the next picture, Tiffany. The first trend is what we call um, AI or artificial intelligence is the new UI. And what this is, is a recognition that artificial intelligence, which was originally developed largely to make the business processes smarter, is moving from the back end to the front end in the way consumers and clinicians actually experience healthcare. Essentially, it's moving from uh, the, the traditional roles around uh, simply uh, analyzing and presenting options uh, for, uh, for the system to a way that humans can interact with the system. We see, for example, natural speech, speech in, uh, interactions that Alexa and Google are doing. Both of those are taking traditional speech and voice recognition technology and augmenting them with artificial intelligence that has done things like significantly reduce the latency between the question and the answer and significantly improved the accuracy of the answers that are rendered. Uh, that ability to move, uh, to, to take artificial intelligence and move it into the user interface really changes the way people experience healthcare. Um, it is likely that as you see these kind of experiences in our uh, personal world from a consumer perspective, that you'll begin to see business and healthcare applications. And it's not too hard to envision, for example, a future where um, the uh, inside of a physician office 
might be one of these devices. And the way that the physician interacts with their clinical technology is through the conversation as opposed to typing, uh, perhaps both listening to the doctor and maybe even listening to the patient and being able to provide uh, a set of activities that are based on that kind of passive interaction. So it really changes the nature of what technology can do because it, 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 it's now a, a passive rather than an active kind of participation. Uh, even more complex, what we see today already is things like using artificial intelligence uh, around things like common uh, symptom navigation. So uh, you might be familiar with HealthTap and a product they launched about a year ago called Dr. AI. Uh, what they really, what they did there was they took a, uh, basically uh, billions of chats that had been created over the last uh, uh, half a decade where a doctor and a caregiver were discussing the patient's common clinical conditions, uh, where, uh, where the patient said maybe woke up with a, symptoms like a sore throat, and they had a conversation where they were trying to figure out whether this was a serious problem or not, whether they should be seen now, whether they can be seen later, whether they should try some symptom treatment. It took all of that history of chats and it trained an AI agent so that now when the patient starts those questions, the technology itself can begin to return additional questions, helping to refine the patient's thinking. It, it gives the patient a much more uh, accessible, higher quality first interaction with the technology as opposed to them having to look things up. And it relieves the system of having to provide caregivers as that first line of interpretation. Ultimately, interactions become simpler and more natural and the healthcare workforce becomes more productive at the same time. The next trend, Tiffany, if you can move to the next one, is something we call ecosystem power plays. And basically, this is a recognition that we used to think about platforms as technologies from different organizations working together to create a benefit. And what we are realizing more and more is that it's not just the technologies that are interacting, it's actually the companies themselves that are interacting. So it's both the business model as well as the technology creating a platform. Um, we, we see, as you can see from some of the data, the 78% uh, of healthcare executives agree that comp competitive advantage will be determined by the strength of its partners and the ecosystem. So not just the technologies, but the actual partners and the business partners themselves. The, we're, we're seeing examples of this right now in, uh, uh, for example, uh, Caremore and Lyft combined to provide transportation for the poor frail elder, for the frail elderly because of the recognition that it's transportation that tends to be one of the rate limiting steps around some of these frail elderly's ability to live alone and care for their chronic conditions. So it's not just the technology, it's actually the company's business models that interact together to create this kind of an advantage. And we our, our data here, uh, the survey data we've done of health organizations, 66% of health organizations right now are already taking steps to participate in the digital ecosystem. So it's not just technology platforms, it's actually business connections that are becoming the uh, expression of the interaction of technology and business. The third trend is what we call the workforce marketplace. And this is an extension of what we had already been seeing, which is a migration of the traditional captive labor markets toward an on-demand and open marketplace for labor. Uh, we, we already know that that happens in, in uh, uh, certain select cases, but the fact that technology allows people to get to workers and workforce and expertise anywhere in the world, and because more and more of the work can be done remotely uh, and, and can be augmented with things like physical robots, so that you can create a different way of pro a different sort of proximity, you really begin to change the nature of the workforce. Tiffany, if you can go to the next next slide. If you look historically, what we've seen is a traditional. What's in the bottom left here, right, is a are uh, basically core teams that were the full time workforce, and then over time, what we you, you see the movement right toward 
high commitment liquid workforce. So this, think of this as um, like things like specialized nurse resource pools, then internal on-demand talent pools. So my own people start to do things. Uh, external uh, network uh, uh, talent pool is really where you start to reach outside of your, your uh, particular network and into other networks. And then uh, basically public crowd freelancing. And we're beginning to see more and more of this in certain conditions, obviously where clinical licensure is a rate limiting step. This isn't necessarily going to play itself out this way, but there are a lot of functions in healthcare that don't require licensure. Um, and where the labor pool, the available labor pool um, might be uh, in different places. And it might be on an episodic basis and a project basis that you need to access the best person. So it's not the closest person um, it's not the person you know it's the best person for the job and we can find them anywhere. This, this broad idea of labor uh, markets being, being uh, completely open uh, ends up being the uh, a centerpiece also for the way we change both the consumer experience as well as the, uh, the labor shortage. So for example, American Well has created an exchange uh, in telemedicine where they they have a series of networks that have been created for employers. So each employer has a network of providers. The challenge is that the demand is bigger than what any given network can provide. So they create a network of networks that allows any customer to have access to any provider that any other network provider has created, creating even uh, an even more uh, robust delivery system than one that would can be created in a, in a simple proprietary way. The next trend is something we call design for humans. And this basic concept is essentially the idea that the way we think about technology is first and foremost built around the way we think people will interact with technology. It's designed to account for their human experiences. It's not necessarily that we build a technology and then force people to conform to the way the technology is organized, but in fact, it's the reverse. What we are effectively doing is we're simplifying complex processes. The processes on the back end, everything on the back end is quite complex, but it's the appearance of simplicity and it's the elegance of it that makes it particularly strong. Uh, we know, for example, that there is a lot of, uh, when you in the technology, when people have to conform to technology, there is a lot of friction and a lot of lost productivity and poor use. Uh, and uh, this is typically the, the case when we basically build technology around the way we work as providers and then turn it loose and ex patient, expect patients to use it. And sometimes that leads us to conclude that the technology was a bad idea, when in fact it was a user interface. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was a, uh, a healthcare system that was thinking about um, a self-service uh, kiosk for patients to do some common uh, things like uh, uh, checking their vital signs and, and other kinds of examinations. And the idea seemed logical because diagnostic equipment existed, uh, the concept of self-serving is that they created these kiosks and they, they put them in shopping centers. And what happened was that they found out that no one used them, even though their research suggested that we, people would use them. And there was a debate as to whether or not they had missed the mark in terms of demand. But what they realized is when they went in and actually watched what was happening, they had decided that the first thing that ha has to happen is the person has to find their medical record before they can interact with the technology. And the decision tree to get to the to get to your medical record required a, a five step log on and authentication and drill down process. And most of the consumers would leave the kiosk by the third step because what they had done is simply taken the workflow that was in their EMR and they had they had exposed it to the consumers. Uh, without really asking the question will consumers have the patience to do this and the conclusion that the concept of self-service was not a good one, was the wrong conclusion. It was that the interaction was the wrong interaction. And that becomes a very critical uh, kind of example. The other side of it is the, uh, the fact that you can actually exploit the consumer's or citizen's desire to act for themselves in a way that creates 
a more productive healthcare system by moving work from the delivery system to the consumers. And if you look, for example, at One Medical, some of you may be familiar with it. One Medical is a primary care physician model that the founders basically built around the principle that a typical primary care physician practice is essentially one physician and four to four and a half non-physicians. That's a typical medical practice. And MGMA numbers vary. But basically what they recognized is that it is possible to run a practice with one and a half non-physicians for every physician. If you change the nature of the work that was done, including using technology to allow patients to do some of the work that otherwise staff would have done. And what they were able to demonstrate is a practice that the practice experience itself becomes distinctive to the consumers. And they have ample evidence that there are patients now that would say, for example, that um, the doctor that they have in this practice is fine, but they really like the practice as an example. The other thing that's happened is that the doctors end up having more time for their patients than they would have historically. And actually the doctor's economics even get better than they would have because when you take away the non-physician cost for that physician's practice and they can see the same number of patients, then the amount of revenue available for physician compensation goes up rather than goes down. And so this idea of designing for humans has the twin effect of making the care experience more personalized, so it's on the patient's terms, and potentially also making the cost of delivery more efficient and more productive by moving some of the work directly to the customers. The fifth trend is a concept we call, oh, actually, before I do that, I want to give you one more example of designing for seniors here as an example of user design. So traditionally, when people think about design, they think about technology user interface around on the right side, bigger buttons, larger fonts, easy to adjust size, adjust size. This work has been done with seniors. We're now looking at what the real issue is with seniors, uh, with, with uh, older adults in their interaction with technology. And if you really study their problems, it's not some of those simple aesthetics. It's actually things like realizing that recognition is much more of a persistent um, ability than recall. So asking people to remember how they do things is much harder than asking people to be able to recognize the structure of things. Consistency, hierarchy, readability in terms of clarity of the sentences, really important. So it's not just the visual aesthetics, it's understanding in a more complex way how people think and interact with technology. The final trend is what we refer to as the uncharted. And what we are recognizing is that these digital technologies that have this rapid exponential adoption are actually creating problems that we never anticipated and are calling for answers that we're not quite prepared to answer. And that becomes a challenge for the adoption of technology, but it also becomes an opportunity for businesses that are introducing the te technology to shape the market and to shape the, re the regulatory landscape as they enter into them. 66% of healthcare executives agree that the innovations they're working on today already fall in regulatory gray areas. Uh, we see, for example, in areas like um, blockchain, as an example, that they, the, the concept of a distributed ledger still requires some form of an authority. And if you're trying to create an environment where there are multiple institutions that have to be the authority, how we govern that process is a discussion for which right now there are organized groups forming together, coalitions, trying to figure out what the answer is going to be. I think one of the best examples of this problem with Uncharted is, is actually being experienced in the autonomous vehicle uh, field. It turns out right now that the best autonomous vehicles in the lab are as safe as the worst driver in a high risk pool. And the question on the table is how safe does an autonomous vehicle have to be before you are uh, before you allow it to be on the road? Is it being as safe as the worst driver in a high risk pool, the standard? 
or the best driver in a high risk pool or the worst driver in an average risk pool or the best driver in an average risk pool or perfect. And depending on the regulatory answer to that question, we can understand how fast these cars are going to be adopted. The autonomous vehicle industry is spending a significant amount of money right now with regulators. The first thing they're trying to do is make sure that perfect isn't the standard, because if perfect becomes the standard, it's not even a standard for which humans are being held to. Think about the same thing around technology for um, uh, diagnostic use. So there are people, there are companies right now that are building technology that might uh, look at a retinal scan or an x-ray image or some other uh, image and try to screen out or make a diagnosis. And if the argument it has to be perfect, it raises the question, well, doctors aren't even perfect, so why is that the standard? But the question as to how good it has to be is a fair question. And it's one that depending on where we as a society draw the line, the adoption of the technology will go either more quickly or less quickly. And it is a recognition for people that are innovating that you are that the technology is likely to get ahead of our social constructs and that part of the adoption of our technology requires a recognition and a consideration of how, are, how we are going to manage those social constructs. Ultimately, these five trends they reinforce the reality that technology is not simply a means to an end. It's actually changing the ends. The nature of care is fundamentally going to be different. It's not going to be how we do it today, but slightly better. It's going to be different. And what's possible is beyond any expectation of what patients or caregivers had even a decade ago. The biggest challenge our organizations are going to face is the pace of change. And one of the challenges that we're going to recognize quickly is that things like five-year plans are not realistic because the plan itself is continuously changing based on what's possible and how the market competes and what our customers expect. And what we're going to see more and more of is that, uh, that the demands that come from expectations that our patients have based on their perceptions and the experiences that they have in life outside of healthcare is going to create a constant drumbeat for doing things differently. And we have two choices. One of those is to argue that we're, that's not possible. If we take that tack, what's going to happen is a growing dissatisfaction that our citizens have with the fact that they're not getting their money's worth in healthcare. And that's going to lead to a whole set of consequences. Uh, or the alternative is that instant, some organizations are going to choose to compete by moving quickly to those alternative models. And for the institutions and the organizations that take a wait and see approach, they're going to recognize that the market moves so quickly that they can move, they can go from a competitive position to an uncompetitive position in a much shorter amount of time than the, what they were used to. The tradition of that bell-shaped curve where you can choose to be a late adopter uh, or um, in that late middle curve, the shape of the curve looks different. It doesn't give you that smooth bell. You have this trial period and then the market moves. And in a competitive market, you go from, from this doesn't make sense to I'm out of position in far less time than you would have expected. So that's our challenge. Our challenge is that the technology speeds up the pace of the market, speeds up the pace of competition, and we need to keep uh, responding by realizing that what's possible isn't set in uh, long-term increments. It's literally evolving every year as we go along. Um, with that, I'll leave you my contact information. Uh, we do have a few minutes. I'm happy to take any questions if you want to uh, to chat, uh, send me any questions. I'm also happy to take any questions, Steve, if you have any for me based on what I just presented. And I thank you all for your attention. Obviously, we have it open for questions now. If people have any they want to chat about. Um, you know, I guess one question that I would have as we look to the future, especially on the regulatory, where mm -hmm. some, of, some of the actual C-suite said they're kind of in a gray area. Yes. What, what, is your, what is your take as we look to the future as to when we can expect, 
you know, some of those regulatory mysteries to kind of be cleared up. Right. Do you have thoughts on a state level and on a federal level? Sure. So I would say a couple of things. Regulations in general always uh, lag the market. They lag market innovation. Um, and what typically happens is uh, that these business models and technologies tend to get refined as much as possible in the part of the market that's not regulated. And the regulations give us the freedom to move into more regulated areas. So for example, if you think about, um, let's, let's look at, uh, as a very large category, um, artificial intelligence and its role in clinical care. What I would say to you is that if we think about artificial intelligence and primarily focus on clinical decision-making, uh, that's probably going to be the slowest to uh, become material. For one thing, it requires a whole lot of validation. And then the second thing is it's going to require the regulatory framework that I described. On the other hand, the opportunity to introduce that technology around non-clinical processes, um, administrative processes, for example, um, uh, scheduling, wayfinding, uh, coordination, all of those sorts of things, those can come much more quickly because they don't have a regulatory framework. The recommendation I would take is think about the technologies and then think about the spaces where regulation is least likely to be important and build your competencies and your comfort in those areas first, rather than focusing on the hardest uh, and then expect and, and waiting for regulatory clarity there, because that's actually going to be the hardest thing to crack. And um, we, we see this repeatedly, right? Entrepreneurial companies look for regulatory seams. They don't try to go in to the hardest part of the business and change the regulation. And I, I think in reality that regulations are going to be driven mostly by the demand side. So as consumers expectations, for example, around virtual and telemedicine become greater, that's going to be expressed as uh, pressure from po political pressure. Uh, and that political pressure is going to be expressed as a regulatory freeing up uh, much more likely than the delivery system pushing on that. Thank you. It looks like we have some questions um, from some attendees. Okay, I'm not. Am I seeing? I'm not seeing any on my end. Um, if you, do you see the the bubble with the question mark? Hang on one second. Um, if you don't, we can read them to you. you read them to me. Of course. Um, the first one is: Do you know of any medical records? or EHR companies that are successfully using blockchains yet? Uh, good question. No. Uh, blockchain, uh, so here's here's the general view on blockchain. Today, uh, blockchain it requires a significant amount of computing power, and therefore the, a the amount of data that can be conveyed in a blockchain is relatively limited, simple identity. We are doing a number of blockchain pilots in healthcare. They tend to be focused around, around small bits of data, like identity of patient, payment information and some physician network things. Um, it is unlikely that a medical record can be conveyed in blockchain without a, a significant increase in the compute power that is available, uh, that is currently available. Uh, and most people are not really focusing on sending large amounts of data on blockchain. The other issue with blockchain is blockchain is a cool technology, but almost one of the challenges we have is that people try to apply blockchain to use cases where blockchain isn't really necessary. So the work we're doing is looking and asking the question, where is a distributed ledger fundamentally required? And is it viable as a means of transportation for information. And the intersection of those two leads to the example that I described. Okay. The next one is what about Amazon moving into healthcare software and services? Well, right now, um, Amazon's public position is the uh, primarily around their logistics. Um, uh, they, which is uh, really taking advantage of the shopping side of Amazon. But Amazon also has uh, Amazon uh, Web Services, which has obviously got a clear footprint in terms of providing the back end of technology and cloud for healthcare. And then also, <coughs> excuse me, Amazon's natural language processing right now is focusing on consumer side healthcare interaction. So, for example, 
Um, if you look at um, that, remember I described to you the, the Dr. AI, which is essentially a chat for common clinical conditions. Amazon was one of the first companies to make that available uh, so that it's uh, pass it so that that technology can reside on an Alexa device. One could envision, I don't know that this is their strategy, but one could envision that they will um, potentially ask the question, if I can make natural conversation with consumers possible, can I make natural conversations for providers possible? And, and Microsoft could ask the same question and Google could ask the same question. And one could potentially envision that they might enter into the, um, the, the voice-based user interface for, for clinical tech technology and software where the user is the clinician and it's replacing the keyboard. One could envision that as a future as well. Not, not their stated roadmap, but anybody who thinks about where they could go could see that all of these natural language companies could move there. Okay, next one. Um, how would you address the cost issues that small primary care practices argue for not adopting technology in their practice? Right, that's a fair question. And first of all, it is an absolute true fact, true fact that the introduction of electronic health records has added friction and lost productivity to physician, uh, to clinicians. Uh, there are uh, research studies that document uh, 10 to 18% productivity losses associated with the input of data. So no question, completely true statement. That being said, there is also no question that the clinical, that the, uh, that the uh, use of electronic uh, health records as an example has had an affirmative or positive impact on death and on other clinical outcomes, uh, adverse conditions. To me, I think about the electronic health record as it exists today, much like a, a minimum safety requirement that you might consider the equivalent of a seat bag or an, uh, a seat belt or an airbag in an automobile. It is true that it adds cost to a car, but we're way past the point where one can negotiate whether or not you should be allowed to drive a car that doesn't have seat belts or an airbag because it's cheaper. Because as a society, that's a minimum expectation. So the next challenge is, given that that isn't going away, what is the approach to solving the problem? So if you look at, for example, what One Medical has done, One Medical has said, we're, we're thinking about this the wrong way. What if we bring in more technology and start focusing on self-service and start reducing our non-physician human labor as a part of our economic model? And they have demonstrated that primary care doctors can actually generate higher incomes without negotiating higher contracts. So at prevailing PPO prices in the market can generate higher incomes if they change the cost structure of their practice by thinking about technology and so moving work that is done by humans in their practice, either to their patients or to technology, the combination of those two allows them to actually increase their income without even increasing their patient load. So there's different ways to think about it. Okay, um, the next one we have is, can you speak to the role of devices such as Alexa as a means to support this effort with seniors? Yeah, um, so, uh, Obviously, uh, Alexa and Google Voice are the two best consumer examples of high quality natural language interaction. Apple is trying to catch up with, with Siri. Uh, the nature of these technologies uh, is constantly being refined by the, the, use, uh, the use of these technologies because one of the things about artificial intelligence is artificial, artificial intelligence is essentially a, uh, uh, it's a technology that has embedded in it. One of the things it has is, is uh, machine learning and machine learning is essentially the ability for technology to uh, continuously get better without being explicitly programmed. How does that happen? Well, first of all, you have to have a, a theory that's an algorithm and then you have to have data. And the data in this case is people's constant conversations that help the technology get better at understanding what people mean and tone of voice, et cetera. What, what we think is going to happen is that the more those technologies get used at home, the better it gets at discriminating. Uh, for example, people will tell you right now, you put it in the home, and in the beginning, it can't tell the difference between the daughter and the mother. But after a while, it learns the difference between the daughter's voice and the mother's voice. Similarly, as older patients use this technology in their normal personal lives, you can envision that this technology keeps getting better 
at understanding um, the vocal qualities and the terminology that might be used by a particular demographic. It could be ethnic, it could be age, whatever. And it, so the use just reinforces the improvement of it. So the way I think this thought list generally goes is this stuff is consumer grade technology. The more the consumers use it, the better it gets at understanding consumers. And then as it gets better at understanding consumers in a general sense, then you can begin to think about how you might go about training it to be useful in the clinical sense. So, because the words spoken in a healthcare conversation are not the words spoken in a normal uh, living room, right? So, in order for it to understand the language that people might have when they talk to their doctors, it has to be present. So, you can what you're going if, if we're going to go down that path, you're going to see that technology being put into these locations and then constantly getting better because people are using it and it's the use of it that makes it better over time. We have another question, and this one uh, uh, you may want to think about it. Can, right. you can you discuss the projected intersection between technology access and usability with the ease of patient access and security, especially from mobile platforms? Mm -hmm. I think the assumption there is that the more technology we have, the more potential points of breach we might have. I, I believe that that's the implicit um, assumption, right? The more digital our interactions are, the more digital vulnerability we introduce. Um, at least that's how I interpret the question, Steve, as it was stated. Right. Um, and right. that being said, uh, absolutely true statement, unequivocally true statement. Um, and security is a non-trivial issue, right? It is a fundamental. It is a fundamental issue, not just around things like financial security, but um, it's leading to it's it's a material issue around uh, national defense and cybersecurity, et cetera. Um, and so we see that the digitization of healthcare interactions has commensurate with it a greater and greater demand for uh, a higher level of security. In fact, uh, it is our belief that 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 level of complexity is going to quickly outstrip an organization's ability to maintain the necessary level of security. And it's going to change the nature of the marketplace for security services from things that institutions do for themselves to a reliance on organizations that are world-class experts at security. And that is going to go not just to core technology, but as you move out to device side, it's going to be the same thing. The other thing that's important to understand, and I'll, let me just finish that, and then I'm going to actually go to a different place. Um, the reason that, uh, for example, the CIA about uh, five years ago, six years ago, made the decision to have Amazon run the CIA data center. Now, they run it on a CIA alone data center, it's not combined, is because they concluded that Amazon has better security than the CIA. And the reason is, is that Amazon is constantly dealing with security and has perfected it to a level that even the CIA couldn't achieve. It, it is our belief that these big tech companies that run these big data centers are probably some of the leading most secure entities. And people are going to quickly realize that this is the kind of thing that you really need to go to the world class process. And that's going to change the way people purchase technology and who they partner with. The second part of it is that if you actually look at a lot of these security breaches, it's not just that the technology itself was breached, but it's that there was social engineering uh, that essentially human behavior was manipulated. So as hard as you make the technology, the humans can be the weakest link. And that means that culture of security and uh, workforce issues are going to be just as important as the, the technology itself. So security won't just be about the IT and it won't just be about the devices that you buy. It's actually going to be actually going to be about the organization and how it runs itself. So we're going to see both of those things have to play. We, we're really getting some more questions. So uh, Jordan's going to go with with the next one. Excellent. Next one is, um, can we get access to the Accenture Technology Vision Survey to learn more? Sure. Um, you can tell, Steve, you can decide how you want to make it available to your members, but what I've presented is all available. And there's also, uh, there'll be a link there so you can go and look at the full doc, the full report that we've written as well. 
Great. And what we'll do, I'll get with Jordan after this. We'll either make it available on the website or we'll, we've got a list of people who participated on how we get that to you. Yeah, we can, you can push out an Accenture link to them as well and make that possible that way. No problem. Very good. Next question, Jordan. The next question is, do you also measure patient engagement related to digital innovation as this tends to translate to decreased cost? Right? Uh, very good. So um, we do have models of looking at, uh, well, let me, let me just actually, I need to make sure I understand the question. Could you just reread it for me? And I'm going to think hard about what they're going after here because it's a complex question. Do you also measure patient engagement related to digital innovation as this tends to translate to decreased cost? Yeah. So we have um, models of engagement. There are two ways that we think about engagement. One is, um, can you get people to engage in your health? And then to the extent that digital stuff makes them engage more, there is a way to think about that. The other is that there is actually a subpopulation we call the digitally intense population that has demonstrated a propensity or a desire for digital over non-digital sort of um, interactions. And uh, those are slightly different things. In one, you're basically taking a person and saying, what's the best way for me to get them to, uh, to, to care about their health and the answer may or may not be digital. The other is that you start with someone who is naturally digitally inclined and then you figure out how it is that you can reach that person for whatever purpose you want. Uh, both of those are, are things that are measured. The real question, of course, is, is digital engagement directly related to uh, costs? Here's the way I think about it. Uh, and the, because the answer to that question is maybe, it just depends on how you frame it. The, the sort of triumvirate of outcomes, think about this as affordability, access, and effectiveness. Affordability roughly being equated to some version of cost, uh, and then access um, largely being able to be equated to getting to the provider, um, and then uh, that, that you feel is the right provider. And then effectiveness is more of the outcome side of the equation. Um, the, the digital engagement um, the strongest measures have been measures of effectiveness and access. The relationship to cost, there is some, but cost is complicated because what we've seen, for example, is that some of the most profound drivers of cost in our system are things like pricing inefficiencies and the fact that we have a labor-based input model. Um, and lots of societies have tried to play you know, the cost game different ways. And some have been able to get costs down without doing any of these things because they focused on pricing or they focused on other sorts of things. Uh, the data on the ACO is pretty interesting. If you look at what the ACOs did, how they actually lowered costs versus how people thought they would lower costs. Um, all that goes to saying that lowering costs is complicated equation with many parts and being able to parse out engagement and draw a straight line without complicating it with other factors is a little harder. The use, the case around access and the case around um, um, effectiveness are a little stronger. Right. We, we, we have another uh, really good question. Uh, and this is uh, directed to you because of your background as training as a physician, sure. but also on the social determinants of health. Yeah. They want to know they want to know your opinion on how technology can relate to serving the low income, mm -hmm. the homeless, because these people in this population generally don't have access right. or experience right. with technology. Yep. Yep. Excellent question. So I will tell you, um, and we've been actually working on this. I had the pleasure of uh, being in an international uh, dialogue, uh, actually at, sponsored by the Vatican of all people around global health disparities just before Christmas. Um, there is a recognition that, um, in fact, in geographies where there are literally no health care providers, one of the only ways to solve the problem is through technology because it's the only way to project resources to people who um, have no access. And the question, of course, is how does one project the technology? So it depends on the geography. You know, um, there are countries where, exam for example, where you take a local healthcare worker who's a lay worker and you arm them with 
you arm that worker with technology and that technology includes uh, everything from the ability to uh, have a conversation with a clinical expert, the ability to take images and send images back to an expert, um, the ability to get questionnaires. So what you're really doing is you're saying the patient doesn't have to have the technology, but a local person in the community has a technology and you get a little and you get some uh, benefit that way. If you go to some places in India, rural India, um, or even in, in certain um, urban areas in Africa where you still don't have clinical coverage and they're still poor, people actually have smartphones because, um, for example, the only form of financial transaction and banking in many of these countries is smartphones. They don't, they're unbanked and they're physically unbanked. So the, 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 the population might have a smartphone and you can reach them through a smartphone. You have to often recognize, though, that uh, and build the build the uh, the the clinical model around the specific technology that they have available to them, as a, as opposed to assuming that uh, they have the technology that you have. So, for example, you see a lot more text-based interaction uh, rather than web-based and app-based interaction in a lot of these markets because there's a very high penetration of telephones with SMS, but not necessarily with internet connection. Uh, so there, the answer is that technology as, as, a, um, as a basic availability is increasing. The biggest problem we have right now is where no broadband infrastructure exists at all. That's a huge problem because there's no possible way to reach that, that population or a proxy for that patient uh, without broadband. Now, the other part of social determinants of care is where things like income and other factors like education interfere. So it's not the presence or absence of the technology, it's other factors that interfere with their uh, interest or ability to get care. And we're studying this right now. Uh, there's actually plenty of evidence, even in um, middle-class America, that when people lose their jobs, for example, they stop taking their medications. And when they stop taking their medications, their clinical circumstances worsen. And what's, what's unfortunate about that is many of these people go to doctors and the doctors miss the cue that the patient is having a financial problem and they see the patient present with a clinical condition that's out of control and they prescribe even more drugs and more treatment. So there's a completely different part of this process that says part of the social determinants of care requires the, 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 the uh, uh, healthcare system to recognize this to be true and to think about the patient as more than just a biological system, but actually respond to these other conditions. And there's published data that shows that uh, over when a patient, when a doctor is presented with a fake standardized patient that presents with asthma out of control. So the patient is actually an actor trained to say certain things in, a, in an actual trial where the doctor agrees to participate, but doesn't know who's a fake patient. And the problem is they can't afford their medicine. Over half the doctors send that patient out with prescriptions for more expensive medications and tests, as opposed to providing them with a less expensive medication. That's a doctor training issue. That's the social determinant part, not a technology problem. Right. Um, let me take a pause here. Jordan, do you have any more questions? No, sir. That looks like that was all of our questions for today. Yeah. Um, we, we, uh, Certainly want to thank quite a few people, and we're going to begin, obviously, with Dr. Savarvi. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation, excellent questions. We want to thank Tiffany and team that are based here uh, in Irving uh, for the relationship with Accenture. And we especially want to thank the 160 people that actually took time out of your schedules to participate in this webinar. And uh, we thank you. We thank you for the excellent questions. And I don't know if you have any closing remarks, uh, Dr. Safarvi, but we uh, certainly appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I look forward to seeing all of you at some point in the future. Thank you. Well, this concludes this webinar. We really appreciate your participation. And Jordan will be getting additional information out as a follow-up to this via uh, working with Tiffany and her team at Accenture. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.